highway to South Africa is as old as the sea. HMS Vanguard follows a route navigated centuries before by the explorers da Gama and Diaz, by Drake and by Jan van Riebeck. Now 6,000 miles lie in the white wake of the battleship and the Cape, our journey's beginning, is in sight. Table Mountain, guardian of the mother city, Cape Town, rises in splendor 3,000 feet towards the skies as Vanguard, bearing the royal family on their first visit to South Africa, enters the bay. In the footsteps of the royal tour, we shall see, through royal eyes, something of South Africa's greatness. The greatness of a temperate land of measureless belt, El Dorado of gold and diamonds, South Africa, chessboard of black and white, cornerstone of Commonwealth. The Union is as rich in hospitality as in natural endowments. Its leaders, the Governor General and Prime Minister, prepared their majesties for a welcome which every visitor, king or commoner, knows to be real and warm. When the royal family set foot on South African soil for the first time, it was appropriate that the place should be Cape Town for other reasons than that the city is the Union's legislative centre and capital of the biggest of the four provinces. For in Cape Town we see the fruition of three centuries of white settlement, the maturity and accomplishment of Cape civilization. Cape Town today, though its setting has often been compared with that of Rio, is a city of marked individuality where old traditions and new can be seen stamped on opposite sides of the streets. And in the metropolis, which speaks two languages, Cape Town gives you a bilingual greeting. Fully a quarter million of Cape Town's 450,000 population lined the streets to witness the royal drive to the Houses of Parliament, where for the first time in Cape history, a reigning monarch opened the Union's Parliament. The route through the city showed Cape Town to the Royal Party only in its most modern aspects. Cape Town, as cosmopolitan as London, has architecture to compare with New York's, and the old city has been thrust aside in the strides towards modernization consistent with one of the world's greatest seaports. Outside City Hall, crowds gathered to hear the King's speech. I thank you sincerely for your words of welcome to the Queen, our daughters and myself, on behalf of the people of the Cape Province and this great city of Cape Town. During their stay in Cape Town, the royal family stayed at Government House. An equally historic residence they visited was the home of Field Marshal Smuts, Grootskur, meaning Big Barn, one of the show places of the Union. The old home of Cecil Rhodes was left to him by South Africa's Prime Ministers in perpetuity. Overlooked by the official Rhodes Memorial and close to the University, it stands on the slope of Table Mountain in the direction of Devil's Peak. In the hearts of all South Africans, the home of the great pioneer is always held as his natural monument. In Basuto land, the royal family were afforded a welcome by the native population as spontaneous and colourful here in the wild Cape hinterland as at any civic welcome. For weeks beforehand, from every corner of the territory's 12,000 square miles, from rocky hills and dusty plains, the Basutos gathered on horse and on foot to greet the white king. <laughs> Like tributaries joining a mighty river, the jogging cavalcade surged on Maseru, the capital.
The occasion was the Pizzo, the award of decorations by the king to the Suto chieftains and warriors, of whom 20,000 did loyal service in the African Pioneer Corps during the war. Third city of the Union, its leading pleasure resort and second biggest port, Durban received the royal family in a manner befitting the town's great war record. Sharing with Cape Town the wartime duties of a major port of call for merchantmen and disembarkation point for troopers, its landlocked harbour received over 200 convoys and 3 million men. Today, Durban thrives in the commerce of peace. At a march past of Durban veterans, the king made personal acknowledgement of South Africa's fighting sons. And later, His Majesty was at the saluting base when representatives of Durban's ex-service men and women marched past. Our journey through South Africa takes a giant stride north to the scene of what is perhaps the world's greatest natural wonder, to southern Rhodesia, where at Victoria Falls, the Zambezi River unleashes its torrent in majesty to the thunder of crashing waters like a million waves. Of all the great sights which this subcontinent has in plenitude, this spectacle possesses the strongest power to grip the memory in lifelong remembrance. This is, too, the spirit of Rhodesia in a single glimpse. In the presence of a creation no human hand could fashion, all mortal footsteps stop at the brink of the falls. Across the mile-wide chasm, the Zambezi hurls its foaming waters downwards onto the rocks 350 feet below, and eternally wears a rainbow for its diadem. For the sportsman as well as the naturalist, South Africa has gifts of unsurpassed appeal. And the princesses, both inveterate and accomplished horsewomen, were quick to seize an opportunity to go riding when the arduous program of the tour permitted them an hour's relaxation. And where better for a canter than the sandy shore of Bonzo Bay, favourite venue of holidaymakers, a pleasure ground fit for a princess. South Africa is unseen if the game reserve, as everyone knows, the Kruger National Park, is not included in the itinerary. In these 9,000 square miles of flat bush, forest and grassland, as large as Wales, man has halted at the frontiers and the domain belongs to nature. It's a popular and widely held belief that the animals, living in perfect safety from man, if not from themselves, are aware of their statutory immunity. Certainly, as nowhere else in the world, a wide diversity of wildlife can be seen at closest quarters. Animal species, which elsewhere are dying out, thrive and multiply here on the low felt. Vast areas of the park seldom see the footprint of the intruder, man. Yet, even its highways hold no fear for its denizens, who provide rich portraiture for the hunter with the lens. Here in the game reserve is South Africa as it was when the world was young. In northern Rhodesia too, time has dealt gently with the native way of life. The river and the canoe remain the major highway and transport for the black tribes. And the canoe leader's chant falls on our ears like an echo from the primitive past. <laughs> Down the swirling Zambezi, escorted by a fleet of canoes, as his ancestors might have gone to make war, the chief of the Barotse tribe, King Imwiko, is born in state to exchange salutations with the royal family. The incongruity of his royal regalia may strike strangely upon Western eyes, but King Imwiko is every inch the figure of a monarch and the splendor and solemnity of the occasion is emphasized by his train of musicians. In the manner of 
of his royal forebears, King Imwiko, bows before the monarch from across the seas. Ancient Africa salutes the presence of another civilization.